Welcome back to Face the Nation. Joining us now, Thurston Clark, the author of JFK's Last 100 Days, CBS News contributor Douglas Brinkley, and the University of Virginia Center for Politics, Larry Sabato. Doug Brinkley, beyond this tragedy, why was this such an important uh, anniversary uh, for America? Well, I think a lot of people are remembering where they were, what I did that day. This was brought to us live on television. You were playing clips of Walter Cronkite while everybody was turning into Cronkite. What's going on? Not just um, John F. Kennedy died, but who did it? Then who is Lee Harvey Oswald? Who's Jack Ruby? Why is Jackie Kennedy still wearing a pink Chanel suit with blood? Where's Lyndon Johnson? On and on and on for four days, everybody kind of tuned in. And there's a, a line by Bob Dylan who once said, people don't live or die, people just float. Most people live pretty flat line lives, but when Kennedy uh, was killed, they weren't, they, they weren't floating anymore. It was like real time adrenaline for the whole country. And you know, I mean, those of us who were here and covered this story, uh, I think the part that is not really understood today is that beyond this tragedy that we saw unfolding on television, and we'd never seen anything like exactly. this before, Hanging over all this, it was like we all felt on 9-11. We didn't know what it meant. We didn't know if this was the beginning of World War III. We were a year away from the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, it was just this profound, I, I can't understand this. Why is this happening? And, and uh, I think, in a sense, that America was never quite the same as it was uh, after, after that day. Thurston uh, Clark, your book uh, focuses so much on Kennedy's last 100 days. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that period was so important? Because finally, in that period, he was addressing the two great threats to our nation, a nuclear war and racial conflict. You know, at the uh, inauguration, Robert Frost wrote a poem that he couldn't deliver because of the glare from the sun. The last words were, a golden age of poetry and power, of which this noonday is the beginning hour. There was poetry in Kennedy's first two years, but he didn't marry poetry to power until finally, in June, he gave two very important speeches. The first, American University speech proposing a test ban treaty. The second, speech about race, in which he announced he was finally sending a civil rights bill to Congress. Yeah, because uh, race had not been all that important to him, no. uh, or at least publicly. He did not mention it in his inauguration address. He was against James mm. Meredith yeah. enrolling at Ole Miss. Yeah. He urged him not to do mm. it. He was against the March on Washington, uh, sponsored mm -hmm. by Martin Luther King. He, he was originally against it because the march was going to be at the Capitol, and he was afraid it would make it seem as if they were trying to intimidate Congress. So he and Bobby Kennedy were, through negotiations, they moved it um, to down to the Lincoln Memorial. But what you said is right. Uh, Kennedy was very disappointing to the uh, civil rights leaders on civil rights. Um, but when he gave this marvelous speech on the 11th, uh, at that time, Martin Luther King turned to a companion and said, can you believe that white man not only stood up to the plate, he hit it over the ballpark, out of mm. the ballpark. And Larry, uh, one of the nuggets in your new book that uh, I found uh, so interesting, the story of how Jackie Kennedy called the Civil War historian James Robertson the night of the assassination to ask for help putting together her husband's funeral. Mm. Bob, it, it really impressed me enormously when I first heard this, and I decided to stress it in the Kennedy Half Century because I think one of the uh, less well-known stories and less told stories is how Jackie Kennedy helped the country get through this, and somehow in the midst of her shock and grief, even on the flight back from Dallas, she was already planning to have a Lincoln-esque funeral for her husband and to create the myth of Camelot. She was thinking about his legacy. She, when she was told about Lee Harvey Oswald, she said he didn't even have the, uh, the ability, the, the opportunity to die for civil rights. It had to be some silly little communist. She wanted to convert his legacy into something bigger, and she did. But she, she actually uh, tried to replicate in the White House how it had looked when Lincoln's uh, casket had brought there. Yes, brought that, there. Uh, that historian uh, was called by the White House and told uh, to go over to the 
uh, Library of Congress and get all the information he could about Lincoln's uh, funeral. The first thing he said was, in the meantime, you get all the black bunting you can find. He went over to the Library of Congress. They didn't have the lights on. They couldn't find the light switches. They used flashlights, and they found old Harper's Weekly from 1865. He dashed over to the White House. He got there in a sea of black bunting with a team of carpenters already ready to construct the, the Lincoln uh, East Room affair, just as it had been in 1865. And, and Doug, uh, you of course wrote the uh, the wonderful biography of Walter Cronkite. This was a day that not only changed the country, it changed television. Uh, it changed the way we get information. Up until this point, most people got their news from print. Absolutely. Uh, and this, uh, nothing like this had ever happened before. No, in the 50s, you had the key fall for, you know, hearings being brought on TV. Well, that's just Congress's sausage making. And certainly John Glenn's Triple Orbit started bringing people into special effects television. But bringing a real life trauma like this hour after hour after hour uh, with all those poignant moments, including the young Kennedy children there at Arlington National Cemetery and Jackie Kennedy looking so uh, um, almost Madonna like her almost that every time you see that photo of her with the veil it's just just the most gripping drama and as you mentioned after that um, TV becomes Vietnam becomes the television war and Watergate's brought on TV and we're all turned into these big events and follow them through the Kennedy assassination began that as horrible as it was I mean I think what it hit people even harder because they had come to believe, did they not, Thurston, that mm -hmm. they knew the Kennedys better than they'd known any of his predecessors simply because of television. Well, exactly. And uh, Kennedy gave a televised, live televised news conference on average every 16 days. It's extraordinary now if you compare it to what's happened since. Um, you know, the other thing is that again and again you read people say, uh, saying, I knew him as if he was my brother, as if he was my son. Charles de Gaulle said afterwards, they're crying all over France as if he was a Frenchman, a member of their families. I mean, de Gaulle was stunned by this reaction. And he was, and still in my view, mm -hmm. was the best there ever was at television and yes. knowing how to use it and how to communicate uh, on television. <laughs> all, all presidents try to imitate John F. Kennedy, but they can't. He had a special magic, a special combination of rhetorical ability, the ability to inspire, and also self-deprecating humor, which some of our presidents really ought to acquire. But you know, the interesting thing is he didn't like television that much. When he came to the White House, he had all of the sets pulled out, and he left one with rabbit ears so Caroline could watch Lassie. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I must say, I never knew that. Why do you think it is, and I'll, I'll put the question to all three of you, Today, 61% of the American people still believe that Lee Harvey Oswald uh, did not act alone. I think the evidence is overwhelming mm -hmm. that he did. Uh, I've always tried to keep an open mind about these various conspiracy theories, uh, but it, as yet, no one has shown me evidence to convince me uh, that, he, that there was anybody else connected. Why do you think that is, Larry? Uh, people looked at this as one of the most terrible things that had ever happened in American history, and it was. It was so big. How could you balance it with a, a loser, a total loser who had failed at everything, as Lee Harvey Oswald had? There had to be more meaning in it, and they've tried to invest it with meaning by saying, it's the CIA, it's the anti-Castro Cubans, it's LBJ, it's this one, it's that one. But as you say, you have to go by the evidence, and we're still waiting for evidence beyond that of Lee Harvey Oswald, who clearly was guilty. Well, there, there's no question that the, that the administration uh, was using every means they could. They wanted to, to kill Castro, and they were sending sabotage missions in there. Castro knew about that. Uh, but again, there is no evidence that he ever acted on it. In fact, he later said in an interview, I, you know, I, I would always want a second source when I hear something from Castro, but he said, I'm smarter than that, basically. He said they would have obliterated this island if I had done something like that. Look, it's clear Lee Harvey Oswald killed John F. Kennedy. And the, you ask why people wonder. I interviewed Gerald Ford at Rancho Mirage uh, once for a book, and I was asking about NATO and the fall of Saigon and his presidency. And he said, come here. 
He said, look at this, and it was a little stack like this. He said, this is my incoming about my presidency. Now you see this stack, it was like towering. He said, that was about me and the Warren Commission and why I invented a magic bullet. And you know, we, we I think it gets down to the Warren Commission report. I think it was in time sloppy, uh, it was rushed, um, it w but it was right in the end. And maybe on this 50th anniversary, we need to thank people, the legacies of Gerald Ford and John McCloy and Earl Spector and people that worked so hard on those multiple volumes because they, I think, Nailed, uh, nailed the story. Mm -hmm. What do you think, uh, Thurston, that uh, John Kennedy's real legacy is? Oh, first of all, that he was the first, first Catholic elected president. I mean, he kicked open the door. After him came a whole bunch of other minorities. He appointed the first Polish American to his cabinet, John Gronowski. He, he wrote a book about uh, immigration called A Nation of Immigrants, very important to him. Um, the other is, of course, the Cuban Missile Crisis. If, if Kennedy hadn't been president, I don't wonder if we'd be sitting here right now, if there'd be a Dallas. I mean, his role in that was absolutely crucial. And he realized it, too, afterwards at a, at a uh, press conference. Uh, you know, he'd been the only one who didn't want to have a uh, retaliatory strike. At a press conference afterwards, he refers to Abraham Lincoln, asks his cabinet to vote. Lincoln's cabinet, all, they say, 12 eyes. Lincoln says, I vote nay. The nays win. That had to be on his mind. Thank you all very much on this very special uh, weekend uh, in American history. We'll be back in one minute.